good evening. For me, it's a very good morning. May I introduce myself? My name is Johanna Campbell, and I'm an English language specialist. And what that means is that I teach English as a second and foreign language to non-native English speaking students all over the world. Either I go to them or they go to me. I love what I do and I've been doing it for a while, <laughs> about a decade and a half. And one of the things I've discovered through the process of becoming the professional that I am is sort of an odd thing to say and that is this. I suppose in a sort of a way, I owe a debt to failure for getting me to the point where I am. As we go through our time this evening, this is the idea that we are going to explore in this workshop called Cross-Cultural Dialogues, Unlocking the Potential of Failure. It is my responsibility in our time together to create an open and safe space. That is the only way that we can have honest, and integrity-filled discussions about a topic that's this powerful and this nuanced. So let's go ahead and get started with the discussion of our topic. So let's have a look at what we come up with when we attempt to define failure. Full disclosure, I am a linguist. Language is my thing. I love it. So I love a good dictionary. I do. I really do. I confess. But that's not the kind of definition that I'm interested in right now. I am not interested in how somebody else defines failure. I am interested in how we define failure, sort of that filter, that intrinsic filter that resides deep within us through which we see and judge what is or isn't failure. But the most important thing here is I encourage you to consider every thought because that's what we're trying to do. We are trying to, as we say idiomatically, get to the heart of the matter. So as we are exploring this topic, which we will stay with for a moment more, maybe you have sort of this sensation of like tightening in your chest. Maybe even the discussion of failure causes you to feel some level of anxiety. If that is true for you, that's a definition. That counts in this moment that we're practicing. Maybe you do have a visceral response in some capacity. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have something else. Maybe failure to you is something to be despised, to be abhorred. Maybe it is something that causes you to hide or want to hide rather than to be seen. That has been true for me. Failure is feeling inferior. These are excellent. Failure makes me feel disappointed. I'm going through the chats. Failure can cause shame, yes. Yes, it can. Perhaps interpretation of failure is attached to some very deep sense of shame, exactly as has been said. Maybe it's attached to hurt. That's true for me. Maybe it's attached to sadness, also true for me. Anger, also true for me. So as we continue exploring these ideas, failure can make me at first devastated, but after give me necessary pressure and power to work harder. That's excellent. Failure makes me think afterwards I should have done something differently. So as we continue to explore this topic, one thing is certain. Failure is emotive. That might be a surprise. That wasn't my definition of failure before I started the research for this presentation. So everything that we have discussed so far has sort of been intrinsic. It's been very close to us. It's been very close at home, something that lives within ourselves, whether or not we are even consciously aware of it. So now what I offer is let's take this definition from this intrinsic vantage point and let's draw it out to sort of a more 64,000 foot kind of vantage point, something that's more extrinsic. Now that we have considered what we have to think about failure, let's shift our focus into what culture has to say about failure. Now, these are my examples, and that is all that they are. They are examples. After the series of slides on culture, you will have the opportunity to explore examples in your own cultures. So through this particular portion of our workshop, we will have the opportunity to expose each other to these very important nuanced pieces of meaning in our different cultures. And this is going to widen our awareness of my understanding of you and your understanding of me. 
that is the purpose and the goal here. So again, these five lists, or rather the list of five things on, on the side of the slide, are only examples. Within a cultural sphere, there are an infinite number of options and categories that we could take. I simply have taken five. You will have the opportunity to take more as you see fit. But let's go through the five that I have. Fables, mostly cultures have a similarity of a traditional story where a lesson is learned. Sacred texts, most cultures have some form of sacred text that helps guide certain elements of culture, certainly that influence it, certainly historically. The idea of idioms, here I have used the word idiom, but really the greater context is language. Language influences our culture, so therefore, it seems logical that language would influence our attitudes and ideas about failure, but also because language is malleable and we can shape it and make it what we want it to be, perhaps our influence as a failure are shaped by the language we use. We will explore this topic also in a moment. <clears throat> Ancestral maxims. The United States is a young country. We haven't been around for very long, but we do have a history, albeit a short one, and some of the ancestral maxims, particularly from people who occupied this land before we did, the wisdom that they had to share is also an influence in our culture today. And then finally, the topic of music and film. This is perhaps among the most prolific options, and I will give us some examples of this as well. So let's start at the top of the list with fable. As far as any English language teachers, there are uh, references and links to any and all of the presentation materials here. This picture of the wolf under the tree, this came from read.gov, which is an excellent, excellent resource for uh, American English fables really wonderful material. So very quickly, the story of the fox and the grapes is the fox sees the grapes, he wants the grapes, he tries and tries and jumps and jumps, he can't get the grapes. So we see him here, angry, sitting, looking up at the thing that he can't get, and he snarls and says, Ugh, I didn't want it anyway. My cultural relevance that's extrapolated from this fable is when we fail at something, A, possible response, perhaps not the best, but a possible response is to pretend that it didn't matter anyway. Is this your cultural lens? If not, what would be different? If there's similarity, how exactly are they the same? What proof can you come up with in all of the cultural experience that you have in your mind that supports your thesis to this. This is another example, I only have two, of fables. This is the story of the wolf and the kid. By the way, kid, K-I-D, means baby goat. <laughs> same word, same spelling, same pronunciation for baby human child. <laughs> they are the same. Thank you, English. It is an odd language. The kid gets left behind because he's not paying attention to the rest of the herd of goats. The wolf shows up. He's going to have dinner. The clever little kid asks for one last dance before he's dinner. Wolf plays music. Dogs, like the, the guard dogs, hear the wolf's I'm about to have dinner song. They come and chase him off. Wolf runs away. Goat goes back to the herd. Kid gets to live. The cultural relevance that I pull from this, a, a very familiar way that Americans can look at failure, is that rather than seeing failure as a setback, we view it as a lesson. This may or may not be the same for most other cultures. The question is, is this relevant for you? Is this the same cultural vantage point, the same attitude that you have? If not, how would it be different? If you do, is it exactly the same or is there some nuance there? By the way, the final thought on this particular slide is, as far as the lesson is concerned, <clears throat> the next time that wolf probably won't be so easily sidetracked and that dumb kid probably will be less dumb because of the failure that just happened. This is one of two examples on sacred texts. So this wonderful piece of prose, the word sufferings here, this gerund, can be 
uh, translated also to the word failures. In fact, that is one of the words in, uh, that is a word in one of the editions of, of this particular sacred text. And two things out of this. Number one, this idea that suffering is, or failures are purposeful, that they matter, that they can bring us into a better state if we let them. This is of cultural relevance to how we see the world. This is a common theme that most Americans portray, that most Americans live uh, on the subject of failure. <clears throat> the second thing is this idea that um, failure is so valuable that it produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope, is similar to an idea that we will explore later in our session this evening that is literally titled Celebrate Failure. Just out of curiosity, how many of you ever in your lives have thought of failure celebration? A thumbs up or a thumbs down in the chat? I'm going to, I like that. Yeah, I am too, now that someone who's cleverer at life has explained this idea to me. I think it's an interesting consideration. This is a piece of Buddhist philosophy. As you read this, my question to you is this, if you were to choose between them, which is your choice? The definition that you created a failure or the definition that you read on the screen right now a failure? Which do you prefer? I can share with you that I certainly prefer this one. The idea that I should not fear failure because it is something that is required for a, a good life. I like that better than the harshness through which I judged my own definition. I agree with you, it does sound more optimistic. The next two slides are on idiomatic language. This is a very common piece of language that uh, Americans use. I hear it all the time, to engage in trial and error, to use trial and error to figure out a thing, to have failed at something because you went through trial and error that got you to the next step of whatever it was that you were looking for. The piece of information that's interesting to extrapolate out of this that is relevant to my cultural lens <clears throat> is that to try something is part of getting it wrong. It's almost expected. And to a certain degree, it's almost commonly expected, at least if the frequency with which we use this piece of language is any indication on our intent behind it. So what about you? Any linguistic considerations, particularly idiomatic, since that tends to be the vernacular, of how you view failure? This one was a bit curious. Uh, it's a more American construction to use the verb to botch rather than the phrasal verb to make a botch of something. I confess I'm not as familiar with that. Perhaps it's British English, perhaps it's another form of English, but the more American construction with which I am more familiar is to use to botch. If I botched up a job, then it was something that I failed at. And this is a very common phrase that we use in replace of failure, interestingly enough. So may I offer this to you as another consideration of examples of how we can isolate pieces of filter from our cultural influences that bear weight on how we view failure. This is the one slide I have on ancestral maxims. I love this piece of prose. I think it is exquisite. And it is my pride, really, to share this with you. Um, this is from My American Indian Heritage from the book The Tracker by Tom Brown Jr. The idea of what we learn from nature and particularly here, birds, learning cleverness from the crow, courage from the jay, and how above all of them is ranked the chickadee, which is a tiny bird, it's very small, because of its indomitable spirit. The word here of greatest importance is indomitable. That's the word here, because indomitable is a piece of filter in my cultural relevance for how we view failure. How many of you, quick thumbs up, are familiar with, have watched, or have heard of Zootopia? <laughs> Love it. Me too. Watched, good. 
For any among us who are not familiar with this film, may I encourage you to give it a gander. It's a good piece of, of cinematography. It really is. <clears throat> a couple of pieces, short pieces of information about this. This film swept the International Film Awards in 2017. Um, and it had 72 nominations, 47 wins, including one Oscar, one BAFTA, the top box office film, and importantly for our time together now, it's no surprise to me that this film swept the award ceremonies. <clears throat> its cultural relevance is, is quite integral to how I would argue most Americans view failure. It's quite simple. We just, the, the, the little clip that we heard we have to try, we have to, we have to try, even though we know we could fail. This is embedded in the air that we breathe. This is a very strong piece of our culture, this attitude. So what about for you? What would be similar in this? What would be different? Does this example that I have to offer us right now make you think of other examples? Hopefully that has been true for everything that we've gone through so far. A reconsideration, of where we started, do our intrinsic, our very internal beliefs of what failure is, my definition, my personal definition of how I view failure is extremely harsh. And how my culture perceives failure largely, or at least how we purport to perceive failure is not quite so brutal as my own definition. And that's the point. Engaging in this exploration of these different forces and influences that shape our everything. This gentleman, who at the time of the research that I have compiled, is to date the youngest astronaut in Australia's history. His story is fantastic. He is phenomenal. What he has accomplished is phenomenal. This is hyperlinked, and I encourage you, if you are at all interested, listen to his story. It's wonderful. In all of the specialists whose data and research I explored in compiling this um, workshop that we're experiencing right now, he is the only one that I found that had this to posit, to posit, not deposit, to posit. He posits that the cultural construct of failure is arbitrary. I have never in all my days on earth considered that something that is so deep within me, something that so clearly defines a lot of my perspective, and I'm sorry to admit, shapes some of my actions and has caused me to shy away from things that I really wanted and I really cared about because I was afraid and fearful of failure. It's arbitrary that failure is bad and that success is good. This consideration I wanted to include because I think it's worthy, whether or not we accept or reject, that's not the point. The point is to consider the possibility. Do you know this woman? Phenomenal woman, absolutely phenomenal. She is the empress of the Harry Potter series. She's phenomenally talented. She's an excellent writer. This has been proven multiple times in the books that she has written and presented to her, her world. She's a gifted creator, but do you know what she says about herself? Has anybody heard her personal story? Who she is and how who she is created what she has given the world. Yeah, okay, so some of you, yes, some of you know. Here's what she has to say about herself. These are her words. She is the biggest failure she ever knew. I recently discovered that and I came across that in, um, a primary source, the quote stopped me absolutely cold. It stopped me cold. We know this woman as a profound force in the creative world of writing. She's amazing, absolutely amazing. But I would like to read to you an excerpt from her 2008 commencement address at Harvard University. For those of you who may or may not be familiar, Harvard is a fairly prestigious school here in the United States. And in her commencement address to the 2008 graduates, she tells her story of failure. 
And I love it. I love what she has to say. And it's important for me now to share this with you. This is an excerpt from her speech. She says, so why do I talk about the benefits of failure? Simply because failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I love that. I, I would like to read this again. Simply because failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than what I was and began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. Had I really succeeded at anything else, I might never have found the determination to succeed in the one arena I believed I truly belonged. I was set free because my greatest fear had been realized and I was still alive. I still had a daughter whom I adored and I had an old typewriter and a big idea. And so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. Quickly, a moment of idiomatic exploration. This last sentence that I read, so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. Rock bottom is an idiomatic piece of language that means once you fall to a certain degree, usually you have more space to fall. But when you hit rock bottom, you have fallen so far, you have failed so much that there's no further depth that you can fail. So once you hit rock bottom, that's it. You, your, your life is in ruins. You've hit rock bottom. There's, you cannot go any lower. And that's what she said. Her rock bottom, that ultimate destruction of her life, complete, utter failure, became the solid foundation on which she rebuilt her life. Any of you who know this man, if you do, I'm going to be so impressed. If you don't, here's how you can find out who he is. Please Google the great, or whatever search engine you use, the greatest basketball player who ever lived. This is Michael Jordan. So the people that we have talked about so far, these people worthy of admiration, Tim Gibson, JK Rowling, Michael Jordan. We could add Steve Jobs into this list. These are powerfully influential people whose stories have shaped the world as we know it. And they all argue that how they have achieved what they have achieved is not just because that they have failed, but because they have failed over and over and over and over and over. Steve Jobs has a similar sentiment, and his story of failure is quite profound. He's founder and creator of Apple and eventually Pixar. In his 2005 Stanford address, he tells those graduates, I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could ever have happened to me. He founded the company, and then they fired him in a really public painful way. That's rare. The heaviness, he says, of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. He says quickly, during the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated feature film, Toy Story. We know how that turned out. Raging success. And is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next. I returned to Apple. And the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. And Lauren and I have a wonderful family together. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. For me, never before have I ever considered that who I admire and what I admire about them 
is achieved solely on the basis of the failure in their life. This is a new concept for me. And in my pursuit of trying to understand more about what failure really is, not what I think, not what other people think, but what it really truly is, this was mind blowing for me. There aren't that many people in this world that I admire, but for those who do, they profoundly influence me. Consider who you admire. This can be someone in your private life. It can be someone in your personal life. It can be a public figure, or it can be somebody specific to you. Either is fine. The point is, from perhaps a fresh perspective, I invite you to consider the role failure has played in the lives of the people you admire. And consider what that actually means. Consider the implications of it. So this is what I would like to leave you with. As a consideration, potentially a hypothesis that maybe sums up everything that we have talked about. Really, our perspectives of failure are ours. Therefore, we bear the responsibility of how we perceive it. Because how we perceive it becomes our thought processes. Our thoughts become our actions and our actions are what script our lives. So we carry a tremendous amount of power in this process. Perhaps we're not aware of it. Perhaps in our time together, we have become maybe a little bit more aware of it. What if we choose to perceive failure as education? That is admirable. In this, Russia and the United States share a commonality. We prize education. What if we considered failure as a form of research? Is that not a logical summation of all of our contributions this evening? Please refer back to your original construct when we started our time together this evening. Your definition of failure. Has it changed? Maybe yes, maybe no. But my hope for all of us is that what you wanted out of this workshop, you got. And that as we proceed through our evenings and through our lives, perhaps we can be a little kinder, a little gentler, and maybe a little bit more honest with ourselves about what failure really is rather than our perception of it. It was stated in our comments uh, this evening that sometimes failure is very much self-perceived. Well, yeah, which means we have the power to choose how we perceive it. Thank you all for coming.